level, uh, and that's at the heart of, of Dr. Keating's work. Um, he is currently a professor of psychology, psychiatry, and pediatrics. He's a busy guy at, uh, in, at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's received his PhD and master's in psychology from Johns Hopkins and his bachelor's from uh, Holy Cross. Um, he had a distinguished, he has had a distinguished academic career uh, going through, not only going through some of the leading institutions in applied uh, child development, but in leaving behind a series of institutions which he founded and created. And I think that's very uh, impressive as, as a scholar. That not a, you, you, you have a legacy that really that goes on beyond you. So uh, his initial academic appointment was at the Institute of Child Development at the University of Minnesota, one of the leading departments in, in the field. Uh, he then went on to the University of Maryland. He founded uh, their program in applied developmental psychology. Uh, he then moved to Canada at the University of Toronto, where he was the professor and founding chair of the University of Toronto's Department of Human Development. Um, he did seminal work uh, at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and that's where his and Lou's paths uh, aligned. There he founded their program in human development. We brought him back to uh, the U.S. in 2004 when he came to the University of Michigan as director of their uh, Center of, for Human Growth and Development. So a very impressive uh, academic career uh, with him currently at the University of Michigan. Um, Dan's work goes beyond that of typical scientists because he's interested in the who, what, why, when of uh, human development. Uh, he's interested in the population and who is at risk for uh, developmental adversities and who are exposed to toxic stressors. Um, he's interested in what are the factors that uh, account for the impact of, of social adversities, as he describes it. What are the social, social circumstances that have an enduring impact on developmental health? And very critically, the why. You know, what are the mechanisms? What are the, as we'll hear today, both biological and social, that account for the, the cascade of events that, ex that children were exposed to at early adversities experience? And most importantly, he's interested in how how we translate this information into policies and practices that will, will benefit from this research. Um, he has hundreds of publications. I was particularly influenced by the book that he wrote with Clyde Hertzman on developmental health and the wealth of nations. Let that title sink in for a minute. Developmental health and the wealth of nations. It really brings it all together about how the study of human development, uh, thinking about the impacts on health, both physical health, social, emotional, uh, well-being, and how that impacts on the economic and overall uh, functioning of, at the national levels. So developmental health and the wealth of nations. We're thrilled to have you here, Dan. Your title today is The Lifelong Impact of Early Adversity and How to Break the Cycle. The last thing I'll say is uh, this is the title of a book that you recently had released, and uh, you'll find it at a bookstore near you. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> I like to walk around, so I was offered a thing here, so I hope I don't distract you or myself uh, in doing this. Well, anyway, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I am uh, really uh, delighted to be here. That's a routine thing you say, but I really am uh, delighted to be here. Uh, thanks to um, uh, Elizabeth and Katie and the others at Kids Count that helped to arrange this, and particularly to Steve and to Esther Menu, who here at Brown helped to arrange it. And my particular thanks to Lou and Edna for uh, having such a phenomenal lecture series, and, and I'm honored to be, uh, and I'm honored to be the 2017 uh, keynote speaker for this. It's a, it is indeed a, a great honor. As has been mentioned a couple of times, um, Lou and I uh, worked together uh, for a period of time with a human development program at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, um, where I, I had the honor to be the director of that, and Lou was the chair of our advisory committee and. Uh, uh, provided uh, phenomenal advice, uh, is sort of exactly what you want um, in, in, in an advisor, uh, in that he was filled with great ideas, uh, but was it was up to you whether you wanted to follow the advice or not. So it was a phenomenal uh, opportunity, and he had so much to offer that I uh, that I learned from. So the um, the focus of the of the um, talk that I want to give today, as and Steve has alluded to it, is really a uh, uh, I hope a comprehensible and compressed thumbnail sketch of the argument 
uh, that's several hundred pages long in the book that was released um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, titled Born Anxious. The title will make sense more, I hope, as we go along with the subtitle, The Lifelong Impact of Early uh, Life Adversity uh, and How to Break the Cycle. And I will continue with the advertisement. Thank you. Yes, it is, in fact, Barnes & Noble. It's still on the new releases table, uh, if you're interested, and on Amazon and all the other places you can buy it online. And if you feel impelled to tweet it while you're here, that's fine, too. So uh, I will, I'll, just, uh, I'll just take note of that. The, where I want to start with this um, story is to really, when I say how to break the cycle, I think it's important to understand what the cycle is that I'm trying to talk about here. This is a little bit different from a sort of standard science uh, research approach uh, in a variety of ways, although it's highly dependent on all kinds of very uh, down in the dirt, uh, straight up uh, scientific research. One of the ways that it's different uh, is that it is uh, an effort to tell a connected story as to why various things turn up the way that they have turned up. But it's also to sound an alarm and to suggest ways that we can address that sounded alarm in how we go about trying to break the cycle. The cycle that I'm talking about here is unfortunately what we know in the literature as a vicious cycle. It is a cycle that causes harm way more than it needs to if we were to take appropriate actions. So the third thing I would say about this is that in order to take the kinds of steps that we need to take, in order to make the changes that need to be made, we need to understand at a deep level what the mechanisms are that lead us to be in that position. And the reason that we need to understand the mechanisms beyond a straight up scientific curiosity, which is a perfectly legitimate reason to do it, is that without understanding what those mechanisms are, without understanding how that system operates, we won't know where the points of leverage are for change. So the real point here is to try to understand how to find those leverage, how to find that leverage for change. Uh, when Steve and, and uh, uh, Elizabeth and I were talking about this, we talked about trying to uh, reach a balance of, in terms of what the science has to say, what it says for policy, what it says uh, for practice. Uh, and I am uh, organized this in a way I hope that works where I try to integrate that as we talk about particular uh, uh, parts of the cycle and mechanisms. So very briefly, I'll just quickly go through it. This is in lieu of a listed outline for the talk. Um, we're, we're, whoops. And that isn't what I wanted to do at all. Uh, where are we here? There we go. I was trying to do a pointer, um, which will be um, here. All right. So we start with early life adversity and stress, right? It's, uh, we'll choose that as a starting point. Because it goes around, we could choose any of these as a starting point. But I'm going to choose this one as our starting point. And talk then about how this leads to, uh, in a, in a straight-up mechanistic way, to a biological embedding and particularly focusing on, on uh, epigenetic and brain, and I'll focus mostly on epigenetics uh, for reasons that will become clear, I hope. That process then leads to a characteristic of stress dysregulation uh, in children who are affected by it, uh, using the uh, acronym SDR, because uh, it's too much to say that all the time, uh, and then to how that leads to this pattern of lifelong uh, harm to development and health, or to developmental health as we've attempted to, to do it. From there, talking about that, how that ramps up to the societal level, how social inequality uh, plays into this, and what's emerging as something that I actually discovered in writing the book, uh, a fairly clear evidence for a rising stress epidemic in our society, which is also part of this cycle, how that then uh, leads to the creation, as we have more and more of this, we have more and more uh, harsh social environments, particularly things that stress parents out and make it hard to nurture well, with that, which then leads, of course, to further early life adversity and stress. This is why it's a cycle. This particular cycle is not a good cycle. Uh, and so we want to try to understand that. OK. So let me start here. Uh, something that everybody in this room, I expect, already knows. Um, and I'm going out of the cycle here to emphasize the part that what we know from a lot of literature is that early life adversity and stress from social epidemiological and other literature, early life adversity and stress is 
uh, clearly highly predictive for patterns of lifelong harm for developmental health. This is a, um, uh, uh, the, the Phelans have talked about this as a fundamental fact. We really cannot get away from this in terms of various um, uh, ways that we might look at it. And this has a bit of a history. I'll just quickly sketch the history behind some of how we, uh, how we got to a variety of these sorts of things. There are other history patterns that one could, could talk about. Um, the Barker hypothesis is one of the important early periods, uh, early uh, findings in this area, uh, which specifically was looking at um, you know, longitudinal study from birth uh, to uh, middle age uh, in the UK. It linked the suboptimal intrauterine growth to midlife cardiovascular disease. This was quite revolutionary at the time, uh, maybe not so much now, but certainly at the time it was, because almost all of the focus on how the social environment would have an impact on health uh, and longevity for that matter, was tied to what happened at the, during adulthood. What are the stressors on adults? What kinds of things happen to adults? Barker's argument was to say a lot of that is already, in a sense, set from an early stressor, an early life adversity, in this case, prenatally. Uh, another one that's very important, another UK study, was the work of Sir Michael Marmot, uh, where he essentially was linking lower social status in the UK civil service, where you were able to control for a whole host of those potential adult things. They had questionnaires about lifestyle. Healthcare access was not an issue because it was in the UK. Uh, a variety of other kinds of things. There was no occupational safety and health issue. Uh, that would be going on because these were all civil servants working with paper primarily. And so, the, uh, nevertheless, when you compared uh, individuals at the lowest level uh, within the civil service to the top level uh, of that the four level system, uh, you'd find uh, elevated risk for a wide range of diseases, sometimes up to uh, odds ratios of four, four times as likely to exhibit certain kinds of uh, diseases. So it was clear something pervasive is going on, uh, and it's clearly tied to status, to social position in some way. Uh, within our program uh, at CIFAR, uh, Clyde Hertzman and Chris Power uh, did a lot of work with the 1958 UK uh, birth cohort, essentially saying this is true if you just simply start with the family of origin. If you start with uh, not what your current social status is, but with the social status of your family, you recover virtually all of those same kinds of developmental health outcomes well into adulthood. And we now more recently know about this using retrospective questionnaires, uh, Felitti's adverse childhood experiences using large samples uh, from the uh, Kaiser Permanente database uh, for the US population, essentially says this is retrospective, but it matches up with this. If you ask people the larger amount of cumulative risk that they have, the more likely they are to show a variety of problems, mental and physical health problems, um, in adulthood. So everybody could come up with their own list. This is one I think that captures a, a lot of the, the, the uh, material uh, in this. When we uh, went to kind of capture a variety of these things and talk about them, we then wanted to say, what kinds of outcomes does this apply to, right? What's the range of outcomes that this applies to? And as we went through this and went through other longitudinal databases and so forth, it became pretty clear if you look at the social disparities, if you look at them from the point of view of just an SES marker, social position markers, or if you look at race and ethnicity differences, what we find is that the same pattern happens for virtually all of them. And they have the same or similar kinds of social patterning from physical health, um, educational achievement, uh, and Robbie Case did a fair bit of work on this, as did Doug Wilms, uh, career trajectories, what is your occupational uh, destiny, uh, mental health conditions, uh, as well as diagnosis differentials, not just mental health conditions, but it goes in the other direction. So if you look at a variety of things uh, in this area, you would find, for example, um, that African American children are much more likely to be diagnosed with conduct disorder when they in fact have autism, and they're much less likely to be identified, uh, diagnosed correctly with autism, and then when they are identified, it's typically at a much later age. So it's not just the conditions, but also the diagnosis differentials, which means, of course, getting the right treatments uh, to the right kids at the right time is affected by that. Justice system involvement obviously uh, follows the same pattern as we all know. 
or in other words, the full range of developmental health, which was the nature of the, the reason that we, we titled the book um, uh, that we uh, our group first did together that I and Clyde edited, uh, Developmental Health and the Wealth of Nations. As Steve correctly points out, uh, we tried to get it named Developmental Health as the Wealth of Nations, but we couldn't get the publisher to go for it. Um, but, but essentially our argument is that if you're really looking at what it is that's going to drive how well societies are going to do in the future, it's how well they're able to sustain and build their populations. And that population developmental health is a key to that, and the key to that is early life. And so that was, the, that was essentially the logic. Couldn't get it all in the title, but, but we tried the best we could. Um, OK, going back to this original slide, then I, I won't spend any more time on the notion that, and again, I think we all kind of know and agree, we understand how, that this is a connection. What we need to understand, and, and, and what I've been working on for uh, a time, some of my own work, the majority of it from other people, it's a big story, um, is to try to make that connection clearer. And from my point of view, is that has to be a developmental story. It has to be understood in terms of how do these developments occur. And so um, the, the a model, and I, I won't spend too much time on this, this is my attempt to put together what would look like an overall causal model of a lot of these things. Um, uh, but I want to give you a, at least a brief sketch of what the conceptual map looks like. So this uh, connection here, this is actually that red arrow you just saw. So we start here with the social circumstances and the predictors, uh, demographic, uh, one socioeconomic, obviously income education uh, uh, of parents. Uh, there's residential uh, uh, predictors as well. Their segregation, exposures differ by uh, um, where you happen to be living and so forth. This is that same arrow. It predicts this full wide range of developmental health, physical health, mental health, and so forth. The developmental story is in terms of a mediator between these two uh, outcomes, between these predictors and these outcomes. These then have a reciprocal relationship. These developmental uh, mediators have a reciprocal relationship. Those that are experience-based, things that happen to an individual, and then things about that individual. It's reciprocal because they keep feeding back and forth. I won't go through all of them, it's too much. But you can have things like social interactions, you could have physical exposures. In Michigan, you probably have heard, we've got a significant issue in Flint, Michigan, with lead in the water, and that has been a significant concern for very good reasons. Material resources, adequate nutrition, uh, housing, and so forth. That interacts with, it leads to causes over here, which comes back that way in causal and keeps circulating around. Genetic and epigenetic factors uh, that are going on, brain and biology factors, behavior and so forth. So one of the things that we know in the story that I'm going to talk about uh, a fair bit has to do with what's the nature of the social interactions between the parent and child in terms of high stress, uh, or as uh, uh, folks around here have talked about a lot too, toxic stress how that has then an impact on, through an epigenetic pathway, on emotion regulation, particularly attention regulation uh, and other factors, but particularly the regulatory framework if it goes badly and you have stress dysregulation. That, of course, and I'll talk about this in more detail, feeds back to the nature of the parent-child interaction. If you have a child who's stress dysregulated, parenting is a lot harder. You get a lot less out of it. You don't get the same sorts of things going on. So this set of developmental mediators and how they go together is the heart of the story uh, that I want to talk about. But all of these, I want to point out, all of them uh, matter, right? One of my uh, 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 a grad student came up to me recently after I gave a talk about this stuff. It was actually at SRCD recently. Um, who said, you know, I, I, I'm really interested in all this, but somehow whenever I take a look at some of these things, the complexity just explodes. It's just all of these details, all of this can affect this, can affect this, can affect this. There are so many factors that go in. I'm just wondering, you know, how and when can we get other, uh, you know, get a clear idea of what's going on. And I certainly acknowledged that and, and, and said, yes, that is the nature. Uh, that's why science is so much fun, because there's so many things to try to understand about it. But keep in mind, keep in mind that despite all of that complexity, we get some very robust and consistent relationships. So it is complex in its details, but in its overall picture, it's highly robust. What we need to do is to try to unpack that enough to tell us where are the points of leverage 
in a practical and policy way that we can begin to try to uh, make a better uh, reform of the things that we're doing in order to uh, improve things. Now, just to make it clear um, that we're not, I don't know why we all, in, epidemi in various fields of epidemiology, we always go to mortality data. I think maybe because it's clean, right? I mean, you know, you kind of know whether somebody's alive or dead. You're, you, you may not know, you know, kind of what their internal psychological workings are, but, you know, that's a good indicator. Um, and to emphasize that these indicators matter in a variety of ways. I'll come back to this slide with a little more detail later uh, for another part of the story. But the point that I want to make here is that when we talk about early adversity, we're really, uh, the best and most common data we use are SES data, which can be education data, can be income data, can be occupation data, a variety of things. They tend to correlate pretty highly for some reasons they matter for others in the general case they don't matter a lot but I want to point out that one of the things that we're going to aim towards that I'm going to try to aim towards explaining is that uh, the the uh, uh, this is mortality data this is from a uh, National Academy of Sciences publication uh, relatively recently um, and you'll see if you're in this field some of the uh, well-known names up there uh, what we're looking at here is what we call, and others obviously call as well, a social gradient. Down here we have, in this case, I think it's an education, one where you have low education, middle education, higher education, and over here you have a uh, death rate per 100,000 in three different countries. What you can see is that in all cases there is a gradient, right? So that if you're of low income uh, in Norway, you're going to be dying at a younger age than if you are of high income. That's also true uh, in Sweden, and it's certainly true in the US. What we find, though, if you look at this uh, gradient, what we find is that there's clearly differences in the steepness of the gradient, right? Some have very steep gradients. The US has a particularly steep gradient. Uh, Norway, in this case, has a relatively flatter gradient. One of the things I'll, I'll come back to is that that also makes a difference for the average age of, of the average life expectancy or average longevity. But the steepness of the gradient is an indicator of social inequality. It's an indicator of inequality that has its effects on the outcomes. In this case, a mortality outcome. But as I'll talk about in a moment, we see it in lots of other outcomes as well. So this is serious business from my point of view. The degree that we have social inequality and we allow social inequality to become uh, dominant, we wind up with significant risks to lots of things, including longevity. Okay. So if we want to try to understand this or unpack this, how early adversity works, what do we need to account for, right? So a good place to start with any of these kinds of questions is to say, um, if we had a good explanation, what would it need to explain, right? What are the things it needs to explain? For any one thing, you can come up with a bunch of explanations. The more constraints you can put on it, the more that you can say, okay, this cycle of explanations isn't gonna cut it. It might answer this, but it doesn't answer that. Here are the key ones from my point of view. These effects that we're talking about are pervasive. It's not just one thing, right? Uh, uh, lead, terrible as it is, has particular effects. It tends not to affect everything, right? Genetic vulnerabilities are real, but they tend to affect a particular thing. In this case, what we're seeing is this early adversity has lots of effects. It affects childhood problems in development, childhood problems in behavior. It affects adolescent achievement and health. I'll talk about some of our work on that in a little bit later. It affects adult diseases of many types, not just the cardiovascular risk that Barker talked about, but across the board, as Marmot uh, uh, showed. And as I just talked about, of course, it affects longevity. The other constraint that we have on this is that these are portable. They can, can persist through changing context. Not all changing context, but many changing contexts. That is, the fact that you have now uh, uh, achieved uh, a higher status in life than you started out with doesn't necessarily mean that you've gotten rid of the effects of early adversity. It takes more than that. Some individuals do, but just because simply that the context has changed doesn't necessarily mean that the pattern has changed. And as I've already seen, these effects are lifelong. So any account that we come up with 
from my point of view, needs to be able to deal with those sorts of things. Okay. I'm not going to go through this. I, I, because I'm going to circulate a PDF of the slides, I put the review things in here so you can dig through all of these things for more details on all of the stuff um, that, that uh, I've talked about up to this point. All right, so let's come back to this now. All right, let's come back to our cycle. And we're, what we need now is to think about this arrow. That is, how does this, as the phrase goes, get under the skin? All right, what are the ways that we do that? Why do we need to know that, right? Well, if you're going to have something that explains differences, let's say, in adolescent achievement and health, and many other developmental health outcomes, just to understand that and adult heart disease, let's say, or other diseases, how are they affected by early adversity? It needs to be something that gets under the skin. It's not a temporary, ephemeral, short-lived thing. It's something that is part of you, OK? And the phrase that we use to talk about that uh, is biological embedding. Right? And what we've seen over the recent years is we've come to a much better understanding of how that could be true. We can talk all we want in general about, oh, well, it's both nature and nurture. But until we understand the mechanisms by which they interact, we're kind of waving our hands at it. We've got a much better idea now of what those are. We've learned for a while now that brains listen to the environment through neural sculpting or synaptic pruning or choose your metaphor, basically what that means is that the brain is designed to do a set of things, but the way in which it actually gets shaped is going to be a function of the experiences that it has. Early development is very key to that. It has a very uh, important impact on how the brain is getting wired. As Dio Hebb said decades ago, things that fire together, wire together. So if it happens that way, you get this new patterning, which makes sense. The organism needs to be responsive to the environment it finds itself in. It's not going to be uh, the same brain work for every environment. So there's this pattern. The other thing I would point out, just because it's an area I work in, is that adolescence is a second critical period in this. There's a huge proliferation of new synaptic material uh, in adolescence. That also gets sculpted in shape. Much more recently, we've come to understand that genes are also able to listen to their environment through the epigenetic modification of gene expression. That is to say that what we understand is that there are ways in which the genetic programming is set, but the way in which that gene will function, set at conception, but the way in which that gene will function is controlled to some extent by programming that happens after the DNA is uh, uh, a pattern is set. There is in this, as in many things, an early life effects bias, uh, but not exclusively so. Epigenetic uh, modifications continue to happen throughout life. Um, and, but the early ones, many of them will have life course consequences. The other thing I won't dwell on, but I will mention it, is that there's also a strong potential and literature is starting to accumulate on this for the transgenerational transmission via a biological inheritance. So that if you have an epigenetic modification, that may be passed on to the next generation as well, which would predict then an enduring population burden. The consequence of this, it has consequences for how people think about evolution. Some people think it has a big consequence. Some people think not so much. Uh, it's a kind of a Lamarckian model, acquired characteristics being passed along. Um, the point that I want to make here, though, is that it will, uh, to the extent that this is true, and I think there's good reasons to think in some cases it is true, that what we're dealing with is something that we are creating a burden not at birth or very early in life, not just for that individual's lifetime, but may carry it well beyond that. And so we need to be very thoughtful about what are the things that we're doing to structure our social environments that will support, um, uh, that will support early development. Okay. Again, a set of reviews uh, when you want to, oh, I'll, I'll call attention, but I don't think Barry Lester was able to be here today. Uh, one of your colleagues here at Brown, uh, this paper uh, would call your attention to a special issue in child development, and I've uh, parroted it for a couple of figures. Those of you who are not familiar with epigenetics, 
uh, after this two slides, you still won't be very familiar with it, but um, at least you'll have some idea uh, uh, of what we're talking about here. Basically, what we're talking about here is one kind of epigenetic modification called methylation. And basically, if you see this as a this is a, a gene here, it has all genes have two regions: a promoter region uh, and the gene body. Uh, ultimately, what genes do is they produce stuff. Right? It's a little factory, and it produces various kinds of, uh, of uh, important things, proteins that go throughout the body to do various things. Without going into any detail, basically what you have is, in this case, an unmethylated promoter. It's all going along fine. It gets to express what it is that it's supposed to do. If that were to become methylated at some of the key sites in the promoter region, what happens is that that is repressed. That is, the gene does not get to express itself. Uh, and therefore, uh, it changes. In our story, I'll come back to it in a moment, the basic idea is that one of the key genes in a stress response system does become methylated with high stress exposures uh, in early life, and that then uh, leads to stress dysregulation in a way that I will describe. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that this is pretty recent um, stuff. So these are uh, 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 PubMed uh, following different topics that have been published. Um, and as you can see, you probably can't, on the x-axis here, this goes up to about 2014. Epigenetics as a field of study has been around in, in total for a while. Most of it has been biomedical uh, or basic biology uh, for a long period of time. It's obviously increasing as well. Uh, others that relate epigenetics to disease, uh, for example, uh, tobacco exposures, relationship to lung cancer appears to be mediated at least to a substantial part by epigenetic modifications. That's an example of a disease model that's epigenetically, um, uh, uh, at least partly causal through epigenetic mechanisms. The one I'll call your attention to is the one down here that just uh, starts to um, uh, creep up uh, quite a bit later, epigenetics and child development, right? And so what you can see is there's a very a relatively later start uh, and uh, uh, still ascending. My guess is if we were now to do, uh, bring us up to the present, we'd actually be up around here. There's been a huge explosion uh, of work in this field and it's continuing um, uh, to tell us new things uh, all the time, not just about the particular story I'm going to tell, but, but many others. Okay. When this uh, uh, methylation happens to the particular gene that I'm talking about in the glucocorticoid um, feedback loop, essentially what happens is that you then may wind up with a stress dysregulated infant. And what we mean by a stress dysregulated infant is an infant who has the pattern that their uh, stress system is amped up. Uh, the HPA axis, which I won't go through in detail, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, uh, is what, what leads to our stress, our physiological stress response. Uh, it starts with an adrenaline response, but quickly moves over to a cortisol response. It's the cortisol response that is the one that's tricky uh, and difficult for our, our, our health over the long haul. I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. But a stress dysregulated infant is a difficult infant to raise. It's a difficult infant to raise because the standard things that we would expect to see as we have, uh, as we're parenting a newborn, right? The routines that we go through in order to bring a uh, distressed infant back into line, right? Back into a calmer state. Uh, and those of you who have parented newborns know all the routine you go through. And it's a little different for each child, but there's a standard set of things, right? Maybe they're hungry, maybe they uh, uh, need a, a diaper change, uh, maybe they're cold, maybe they're hot, maybe they just want some physical touch, they need to be held, they need to be rocked, they need to walk around. You learn these routines for your baby, right? You do them and eventually they calm down and they soothe and it's nice for you, it's nice for them. You get a nice big oxytocin burst, they get a nice big oxytocin burst, it's cool. Now imagine doing that, but you never get to that point, or hardly ever, right? You're dealing with this infant who's just distressed, and you can't get them out of it, right? You're doing this, right? I mean, now all of us have had that experience, you know, that instead of the nice little 20 minute walk in the middle of the night to get them back to sleep, all of a sudden it turns into a two hour stroll around the house, or maybe putting them in the car and driving them around, or whatever it might be. But imagine you can't get there. Routinely can't get there. This is very difficult parenting, right? 
what we know, um, and, and that, by the way, that stress dysregulation can come about, uh, as I mentioned, high stress pregnancies can lead to this kind of stress methylation, uh, an epigenetic inheritance we strongly suspect can lead to that. Genetic vulnerabilities uh, can lead to that. High stress during the early infant years, uh, early infant months can lead to that and so forth. So it can happen for a variety of reasons. Um, how do you go about dealing with this in a way that can make a difference early on? We use this term, started to use this term, the notion of super nurturing. It's that sustaining this and persisting in it in those positive interactions for, towards soothing, towards taking care, can in fact create resilience. We know this, one of the best uh, work in this area is uh, Steve Sumi's work, um, whom you I'm sure all know, primatologist at NIH, uh, where he worked both with peer-reared monkeys, which was an induced stress, or those who were genetically vulnerable, who intended to be, uh, tended to be hyper-reactive. Knew, they knew from the genetic pattern that they were likely to be that way cross-fostered them to extremely tolerant, uh, super-nurturing monkey moms. Is, I mean, it's basically what it is. They would not, uh, they, won't, they just wouldn't give up. They would just stay with it, right? Uh, their natural mom would, uh, in the genetically vulnerable ones, would not likely do that because they would probably be stress dysregulated themselves. Right? So this, this incredibly tolerant mom, um, there's this, um, uh, great picture that Steve shows. Um, I must ask him for it sometime. It's such a great picture. But it's one of these cross foster uh, pairs, the mom and the and the infant, who's clearly you know has the stress issue. Um, and 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 um, the 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 uh, infant is is uh, is sucking on the nipple, but actually has it uh, between its teeth and is pulling back like this. And the monkey mom is just kind of sitting there. Oh yeah, okay, right. You know, that's the kind of thing. Now what happens? When we see that in his cross-fostering studies, is a substantial turnaround in the phys in the underlying physiology about the stress uh, and various kinds of behavioral manifestations that we would never have expected to see uh, from that infant. So it is possible to do that, but this is an enormously challenging task, as I've just talked about, right? So the parents, and the challenge for this is the parents who are uh, in this situation, and keeping in mind they may have a higher, they will have a higher than average chance to be somewhat stress dysregulated themselves. They're not getting that positive reinforcement of being able to soothe their baby, the, and less of that oxytocin burst, right? What can we do about that? Well, clearly what we need to do is to figure out how are we going to support those parents uh, in order to try to do that. That's our best shot at that point after we have that stress dysregulated infant. They obviously are going to need some respite for this. You can't just keep doing that. Um, and they need some help in providing that. Now obviously co-parenting when it's available. Um, the partner parent ought to be involved in this and in our society that's typically the dad. Dads have typically not stepped up to the task here as much as they ought to do that. They need to do that, but whoever the co-parent is, if there is a co-parent, um, that's an important uh, opportunity to do that. Uh, what uh, 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 Sarah Hurry talked about is alloparenting. Other parenting can come from extended family or from others who are not actual kin, uh, can provide that. Her argument, which is very interesting, is that one of our great competitive advantages as a species is that we are very good at alloparenting. I should say in Steve's study, uh, where they did the cross-fostering, the amount of work they had to go through to get a cross-fostering going, because monkeys are not typically likely to take on a, a somebody else's uh, infant, uh, that, pos that process um, uh, is one that uh, is also a way to try to boost this potential for super nurturing. And programmatic approaches, right? Um, that we could try to do that. very high quality uh, early child care, home visiting patterns, early Head Start, other kinds of programs where we are, in a sense, stepping in to help out when you have this particularly challenging infant is a goal that is worth trying to work towards, as challenging as it may be. But it is one of the ways that we, the few ways that we know about, you can actually turn that whole pattern around rather than just mitigate it or work around it at a later point in development. Okay, so. To come back to the story very quickly, the focus of, that I worked on in the book and used as my narrative thread, you could choose something else, is on a particular gene, this NR3C1, 
uh, in the glucocorticoid feedback network of the stress response system. Um, and the, the reasons I focused on that is one is the book, so you need, it's a general audience book, needs to have a story, so I wanted to follow that through. But why that candidate gene? It's not just for that reason. Um, it, 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 it's, it, it has this effect of leading to an amped up stress system uh, on, on line 24-7. Uh, so to speak, uh, and very difficult to come back to baseline calm. Uh, I, it's also it was the earliest one that was studied. Michael Meany's work and his colleagues at McGill uh, were the ones who kind of got this uh, whole enterprise underway of social epigenetics. It's been the most frequently studied since then. Uh, many, many different studies. The evidence has accumulated all in roughly the same, pretty much the same direction, whether you're looking at animal studies or human studies, and from multiple cell types, which is a complication I won't go into here, but it matters. But here, in fact, we've got it from multiple cell types. The other thing is that dysregulated stress response, we know from other epidemiological evidence, is a key factor leading to this range of diseases and disorders. That is, it has the potential to show up as the pervasive effects that we've observed uh, otherwise, right? Uh, so basically, the way that this works is, uh, well, first, keep in mind, I don't want to, anybody to go away and say, oh, gee, the stress system is a problem. The stress system is essential to life. We've got to have it, you know? As Garrison Keillor says, it tells us what to, that we've got to get up and do what we've got to do, right? Uh, like powder milk biscuits, we've got to get going. It's a younger crowd. Uh, that's a reference that uh, some of you have. I, I was in Minnesota when it got started there, so it just always sticks in my mind. Uh, anyway, the, the, um, uh, the, the notion here is that it's a very important one, not only for your diurnal rhythm, but also in response to threats. Uh, you need to be able to do it. You need to be able to you know, respond. There's a tiger in the bush. You better get moving, right? However, excess or toxic stress levels, if they occur during pregnancy to the mother, or during an infant's roughly first year of life, and the first year of life indicator is looking at the differences between the Romanian orphan studies uh, who were severely stressed uh, early in infancy. If you're not familiar with that work, it's hard to read, but important information. When those adoptions, the very much better places occurred after the first year of life, much less recovery. Before the first year, first birthday, substantially more recovery. I mean, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's, it's a pretty good one, right? can also trigger that same epigenetic change, that same methylation that leads to the same kind of a stress dysregulated pattern. And basically the reason, the logic here, I don't like just so stories in evolution, but I think it's a pretty good argument here, that this presents an environmental signal to either the fetus in the womb or to the new, uh, new baby that there's a dangerous environment out there, so you'd better be vigilant, right? That in fact, if the mom is so stressed that it is sufficient for the cortisol to go through the placental barrier, and there's the unfortunate event that once it penetrates it, it makes opens a gateway for more cortisol to get through. Once you've had that happen, that's a signal to the fetus, wait a second, something must be pretty bad out there. Mom's pretty stressed, right? Similarly, in early life, if parents, if a caretaker, caregiver is not available, right? in the way that they need to be with that warm, responsive uh, pattern of, of positive nurturing, they're not available. Again, it's a signal. In, in Meany's uh, uh, original stuff, it was the, the mother was not, the mother rat was not engaging in archback licking and grooming, which is the, the primary sort of signal that there's nurturing going on um, uh, for, for the, for the uh, baby. Uh, the, um, uh, the absence of that, right? Again, signals that there must be a problem. Something must have happened, right? Or as my, my uh, colleague who passed away, unfortunately, to young Clyde Hertzman, said when we first heard about this, oh, this is an environmental signal that the gene listens to. You better live fast and live hard because you're likely to die young. There's a cost to staying on alert 24-7, but it might keep you alive long enough to reproduce, right? And so it's a signal. It's a, we see this, as I say, across species. We've seen it in monkeys. We've seen it in rodents. We see it in humans. Uh, it must be a pretty important signal for it to happen in that particular way. There are, however, of course, pathways to resilience. I've already talked about super nurturing in infancy uh, as, as an important pathway to resilience. And in fact, it's one of the only ones that we know about that it's not just a mitigation or workaround, but in fact can reverse the system. We actually have, they actually wind up with a physiologically more uh, attuned uh, stress response system. 
Later on, we don't seem to know how to get to that point that we can do turnarounds, but we can do lots of other kinds of things um, that will make very big differences in the things that we care about, in the behavior, and in the health. Uh, here are the big ones, and these will be no surprise to you if you know the resilience literature or other literatures on stress. Uh, they'll be pretty familiar, but just to be clear, social connection turns out to be the big one, right? If you have strong social connections, then in fact you've got a substantial protection against the various kinds of behavioral and health effects uh, that, we, that we've talked about. Obviously, if it hasn't happened in infancy, within your individual family, your, uh, your, the group that you're with, it may not be very likely to happen after infancy either, right? If it's a disrupted attachment uh, uh, situation, it's not very likely that all of a sudden there will be a big reversal in that. So you're going to have to look elsewhere for those social connections most of the time. And a lot of the evidence uh, shows this. So, uh, and my colleague from Minnesota, Ann Masson's book on ordinary magic, talked about this a good deal, that if you're going to overcome early adversity, having a strong social connection with someone somewhere along the way in the developmental period, uh, sometimes referred to as surrogate attachment figures, that's the best that we know of for creating uh, resilient uh, individuals. You have both support and nurturance that enables you to carry on with things to help you learn how to regulate your own emotions, behavior, attention, and so forth by having someone that you trust to bounce off of. But also, it is biological counteragents. I've already mentioned oxytocin, serotonin is the other one that I'm sure you know about. It's a target of most of the antidepressants. These are the kind of feel-good social neurohormones, right? These are the things that make us feel good. Um, they come in the normal course of events primarily through social connections. Oxytocin typically in more close and intimate connections, serotonin from there, but also from larger social networks that we get those positive experiences. The thing to understand about them is that they are biologically counteragents to cortisol. Right? They, in fact, are direct biological counteragents to cortisol. So it not only makes us feel good, it takes away the feeling of being agitated and overwhelmed uh, that goes along with stress dysregulation. Let me just note here, I don't want to keep being the Debbie Downer here, but this is harder for, social, for stress dysregulated people to achieve. Right? Their behavior can be pretty off-putting. Uh, right? They're, they're, they're doing various things that make it hard to do that. Okay. Another uh, uh, major one that we've actually talked about more recently, and there's been actually a, a burst of research in this, and, and I think a lot of it's quite reliable, on mindfulness-based stress reduction. Right? So if you think of social connection as a way to mitigate these effects of stress, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is probably only available to us as humans because we have that capability, and increasingly we have it from adolescence forward because we have more powerful prefrontal cortex, that that uh, uh, enables us to shift our focus, to consciously train ourselves to focus on what the present situation is, what's going on now, what's happening, not to ruminate about the past or regret or resent the past, perhaps to learn from the past, but not with rumination or resentment uh, or regrets. Also, not to fear the future, not to create worries uh, uh, going forward. Again, different from actual planning, planning to do something and executing a plan is a good counteragent to stress, um, but fearing in a generic way, oh, what's going to happen is not. And these have been shown to have that actually observe brain changes uh, in, in a variety of different kinds of studies. Another big one is physical exercise, as you might imagine, cortisol being fight and flight. If you take physical action, it tends to use up the cortisol. Um, the other one that's pretty important, it's not actually resilience, but how to not get into the non-resilient group, is to avoid those unhealthy things that reduce cortisol uh, and provide temporary relief that have lots of bad downstream consequences. Uh, comfort foods or hyperpalatable nutrition in the, in the scientific term, uh, it, it's a good cortisol agent, counter agent, right? Take a donut, you feel better, right? Doesn't help much on the metabolic and diabetes side, but temporarily you feel better. Uh, alcohol, other drugs have the same kind of effect, right? It supplies the kinds of positive feelings that counteract cortisol that you would get, say, from oxytocin and serotonin, but it has ob the obvious downstream uh, negative uh, consequences. 
And keep in mind here, what we're talking about here is that there aren't magic bullets. That is to say that resilience after early adversity is still a minority occurrence even with <coughs> interventions, right? That is to say, uh, the reason I want to emphasize this, and again, I'm not just trying to be a downer here, but it's important to say that we run the risk of big population burdens when we don't deal with it at the beginning and say, oh, it's okay, we can fix it later through resilience programs. We can't fix it later for everybody through resilience programs. We have to do all we can to build our resilience uh, uh, capabilities uh, for kids to take advantage of, and adolescents or even adults for that matter, but the presumption that it doesn't matter that we screwed it up at the start, we can fix it later. No, we can't. Um, uh, not for everybody, not at a population level. At an individual level, yes. And we always strive for that. We always want to hope for that. And as I've talked to many audiences over the years, someone will always come up and tell me about their Uncle Bert, who had a terrible early beginning and is doing just great now. Ray for Uncle Bert, I'm sure it's true. It's great to know, right? But that doesn't mean that the other 90% of people who got similarly, um, you know, sort of difficult early starts uh, are going to make the same sort of thing. The risk that I worry about here is that we can get into a kind of a blaming the victim. Well, these people are resilient. What's the matter with you, right? Just be resilient. No, that isn't how it works, right? So I want to emphasize that isn't magic bullets here. Um, the pathways towards resilience are harder if you've got uh, stress dysregulation at any age, right? Um, there's no evidence that this underlying stress physiology changes much after the first year or so of life. The stress physiology will remain the same. What you can do is mitigate it or work around it, and that can be very effective uh, in terms of behavior and health, but it's still not changing the underlying physiology, which you're still going to have uh, to carry with you, right? Um, and so I think we need to look this points towards, in a policy and practice way, is the need for systemic change that interrupts the cycle before it gets started, before we start to create um, that population burden. It's kind of like lead, right? It's not going to go away. Once it's in your system, it's in your system. And if it's in your system big enough and, and you're a woman and then you're, you're going to have a baby, your baby's going to get your lead, right? Because it turns out that calcium binds uh, to lead quite nicely. And so when your, the, your baby's bones are being built and they use your calcium to do it, boom, here comes the lead along with it, right? Not so terribly different, not a bad analogy, in fact, in terms of stress dysregulation for a variety of reasons. Not a perfect analogy, but not a bad one either. All right. Um, I'm probably going late, aren't I? Okay, I'll speed it through. Sorry, Steve. I just get caught up in this and, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll move along here. Um, okay, so clearly this has effects uh, on uh, behavior and health over time, uh, the stress dysregulation that we've talked about. Um, I've talked about many of these things already. What are the consequences of stress dysregulation? These internal feelings of anxiety, stress, agitation, feeling overwhelmed, how it gets expressed, changes with development. Expressed often as fight or flight, whether you're acting out or withdrawing, or sometimes you get both in rapid succession. Um, it's associated with uh, uh, externalizing and internalizing symptomatology and diagnosis, and it affects learning and co can affect learning and cognitive development as well, largely because of deficient regulatory uh, mechanisms, right? The health picture, okay. Al Sack Lowe, Bruce McEwen's work and many others, uh, essentially says once you've got this stress dysregulation happening over time, you've got too much cortisol in your system over too long a time. It has many effects on uh, uh, lots of different uh, uh, organ systems. Uh, most often um, we think about SES, low SES, economic disadvantage, adverse childhood experiences that concentrate on that, as well as difficulties uh, in early life. Um, that obviously is what we study the most. It's easiest to study in many ways. It has a big impact. But that social gradient picture I want to point out indicates that the stress can occur at any level of SES. Less probability, but individuals in middle and upper middle class are not immune from these sorts of things. The social inequality picture um, that as we move along around the cycle, I've already, we've already seen this. What we see is that this has an effect at a population level uh, as well. Um, we also seem to have evidence uh, with this notion of a stress epidemic. CDC data from 1980 till about now, we've seen substantial increases in stress-related disorders, metabolic disorders, obesity, diabetes, sleep disorders, some others as well, in the 20 to 25 percent range. Uh, we've also got uh, a change in self-reported health that follows a similar pattern over the same period of time. Here's an example. It affects younger cohorts 
more than older cohorts. So this is comparing 2009 uh, uh, to, to, to 1970 data, set late 1970s data. And basically, this is the change by different age groups in how much self-reported uh, uh, self -reported health, right? And what you can see is the folks that have come up later are reporting uh, significantly more uh, of those uh, issues. The stress load that we're talking about here is not just in the expressed diseases that we've just seen, also changes in the physiological stress load. Oh, and it's not just self-reported health, it's just not that I feel report feel bad. Uh, you also have the diseases, but also a stress load index that some folks have just recently published on, uh, where you see a similar inequality. And here, very quickly, is, is the point. What you see is these are data from 1976 to 80. These are data from 2009 to 2014. They created, this is an income uh, down here, they created a stress load index. Uh, you can look, at, look this up and see what they are. It indicates a variety of things that we know to be related to eventual appearance of stress-related diseases. First big thing you see is there's a big increase in the total amount of that stress index, the physical stress index, right? Big increase from the late 70s to now. The other thing is that there's a gradient here, but there's an even bigger gradient there, right? So that the individuals at the bottom of the income have affected most. Middle class individuals have affected uh, even, you know, have substantially been affected. But even those individuals at the higher income levels have seen a similar kind of effect. So what we're seeing is this um, uh, stress uh, um, uh, index buttressing what we see in diseases and in self-reported health. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to summarize this very quickly in the interest of time. Uh, basically, what we see is that the steepness of these social gradients in that picture that I talked about before. We did a study of adolescents looking at their health, self-reported health, looking at their achievement measured by the PISA uh, mechanism uh, and the degree of social participation in their societies, looking only at our Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic countries. Um, and what we see is that those, uh, these sorts of patterns of steep gradients uh, uh, social, indicating social inequality differ substantially across different countries. Some have much flatter gradients, as we saw in the mortality data. Won't go through the methodology. Um, this indicate this is a, a, a one indicator. Each of these is a country. Down here is how unequal they are. Further out here is more unequal uh, in the achievement index. This is what their mean uh, performance of that country was. And there's a pretty strong relationship here. The more unequal, the worse the overall performance. Similarly, the more unequal, the shorter longevity for that country as well. Putting this all together, and I won't go through the details, we created what we called a resilience, a society resilience index. And what you see here is those that come up with have low inequality and high resilience on this column, those that have high inequality and low resilience in this column. Netherlands was on the border, but we wanted to play fair. It was just over, so we put it over there. They probably actually belong over here. Um, but the other thing, not counting the Netherlands, you might notice Australia, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, UK, United States, there's a definite Anglo flavor to that. Uh, I'm Irish. I don't mean that Ireland belongs to the Anglos. What I mean is it was colonized. And so these, these, these uh, uh, UK uh, or English colonized as well as uh, the UK itself um, tend to show this pattern. One of the reasons that I want to, um, uh, the things I want to emphasize here is that, that uh, the importance of looking at these international comparisons of population developmental health is that it tells us a steep inequality is not a condition of life. Some places do it differently, right? High social inequality is not essential to have. Other places have less of it. Why might they have less of it? Um, well, one that we looked at is income inequality. You might think it controls a lot of it. It doesn't. It controls some. There's about maybe 10% of the effect. Bigger effect is from human development investment. How much does a country spend on the variety of things that we consider human development? I'm using the term investment because I think of it as an investment, right? Particularly in early childhood, but not exclusively. Good social safety nets throughout life, good education investment, and so forth. If we took at that, look at that whole group as human development investment, that, that uh, contributes a substantial greater portion to the differences between countries in population outcomes. And one that's hard to measure 
We did a case study of US and Canada of what we called the collective imaginary. How do you think about these sorts of things? Why would you not want to have big income inequality? Why particularly might you want to have substantial human development investments? Well, one of the reasons is that one of the big dimensions, there's two big dimensions that we talked about, uh, is that whether you put it in a rights framework, that is, that everybody has a right to good opportunities for healthy development, right? Versus it's a charity kind of thing, right? You worry about free riding, right? So you can think of this as I've written a couple of papers about this recently as a more justice orientation, right? So one could have a rights framework to say, look, and in fact, the you know a, a proper reading, I would say, and one of the papers was about this, of the um, the United uh, Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the CRC. Uh, you should actually think of this. That rights apply to this. The right to health and development is one of the rights. Of course, the United States is the only remaining country that's not a signatory to that convention. Uh, but nevertheless, you can think of it in those terms. Another is a more utilitarian one, this investment model, right? That it saves us money downstream in terms of a whole bunch of other things we don't need to deal with um, versus, oh, we're giving unearned or undeserved benefits to people, right? If you have a rights approach and an investment approach, that's the kind of thing that you typically see in those high resilience countries. Uh, not so much, uh, unfortunately, in ours. But although Canada is better than us, that was our case study, uh, I should say. All right. When you have high ambient stress, it creates parental um, uh, challenges, uh, how parents can, uh, can uh, nurture. Workplace stress increases in this circumstance, partly because we now know stress is physiologically contagious. The work stress gets carried into the family versus the same kind of contagion process. And then steep inequality itself creates high stress. At the lower end, you're worried about resource concerns, right? Uh, food security, uh, housing, uh, employment, and so forth. At the middle and higher end, where there may not be so many immediate resource concerns, you have worries about losing what we have. The 2008 financial crash left a lot of people uh, feeling pretty stressed, even though they might have been well off and didn't get directly affected uh, by it themselves. Or you might worry about what are your children's future prospects. And we also know that steep inequality is associated with decreased social mobility over time. I'll just put, I try not to get super political, but I can't avoid it. This gets exacerbated when you've got a fearful political climate, right? If you're worried about losing your health insurance, if you're worried about deportation, your stress is going to go high. If you happen to be expecting a baby at that point, or you have an infant at home, it's going to be hard to keep that out of the system altogether. And also just simply status inequality, and if it's a, experience as a loss, the case in Deaton data, where you have white working class individuals for the first time in, uh, I think, hardly ever, showing an increase in mortality. And that's partly because, for whatever reasons, they are experiencing loss and stress, uh, leading to particular causes like opioid epidemic and so forth. But nevertheless, it looks very much, by the way, like the USSR and the post, uh, the Russia after the breakup of the USSR, white working class, individuals in, in, in Russia had their health decline quite steeply. Uh, many of the other former uh, Soviet satellite states actually had substantial improvements in health after that, probably uh, related to those uh, things. So we clearly need to have policies that support parents uh, in this process. Workplace flexibility, particularly for expectant mothers. Workplace civility movement helps everyone, but it particularly helps parents. Parental leave policies, uh, both you know, newborn, uh, new baby, but uh, that are generous. Comp uh, I don't need to tell you guys. U.S. compared to everybody else is not looking so good on that. Uh, and it has to be a reasonable kind of uh, leave that where you protect the income and the career prospects of the individual. Various kinds of programs, home visiting, other supports, but especially for at-risk parents, supports from uh, medical primary care providers, which is an existing institutional point of contact in infancy that we should be trying, and I know a lot of folks here, are trying to make more use of that for this wide range of things that we're, that we're talking about here. And then finally, completing the cycle, um, there are multiple pathways that we need to think about. And I, I like to think of this as our all hands on deck moment. And I don't mean that facetiously, really. We cannot counteract the bad effects of that cycle without focusing on it at all of those points along the way that I've talked about, right? We need to uh, be able to, uh, uh, because it is such a deeply entrenched dynamic system, we need to know where the uh, linked forces are that are happening and push back against them, right? So interrupting that cycle and moving to a more virtuous cycle is that we have to have all of those control parameters that we're going to push on and make it happen. Um, and that's especially helpful 
to do that when we've got coordination and integration across the various groups that have responsibilities for different sectors. Multi-sectoral integration is a terrible term. It's a government term, I guess, but it's really what we're talking about here. You need to get these things happening together. And we also have to remember to include the nonprofit sectors um, like the Y uh, and others that are aiming to support uh, healthy development. Uh, they've uh, changed uh, the way they go about business in a lot of ways and are trying to be important uh, partners in all of this. I want to end on not the downer note, but to say this is not a hopeless task, right? We have lots of things that we can do, and each of those indicates a place that we can do that. Why is it not hopeless? Well, we, I've already talked about the contemporary international comparisons. It's not inevitable to have high steep inequality that leads to high stress, that causes a stress epidemic, that enhances the prospects for early adversity, that keeps that cycle going. Others do it differently. We may not import what they do, but we need to learn from the sorts of, the, the, of things that they're doing. The work by Stephen Pinker the, and the Better Angels of Our Nature and others uh, show substantial progress. If you take a long enough look, we have substantial progress. Violence is down. Your probability of dying from non-natural causes uh, has uh, uh, you know, improved. Your longevity has improved. Uh, you're more likely to die from natural causes than not than ever before in history. All of those sorts of things, despite our focus on particular counterexamples, the reality is, is that the long arc of history is going in that direction. But that kind of progress is not guaranteed. The regression to bad things at particular points in time is also possible. So in addition to trying to move that cycle in a more virtuous direction, we have to always guard against trying allowing it to slide back into an even more, um, even more vicious cycle. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>